Welcome to Native Plants in the Landscape, a presentation by GardenAtoZ.org. I'm Janet McConovich and Stephen Nicola. I'm Janet. He's she, Stephen. And it's uh, brought to you by Relief of Michigan. And we'd like to introduce now Belinda Jones, who uh, oh. was, will say a few things about it. About sure. Okay, um, I want to welcome everyone to this webinar. Um, this, these are indeed weird times and uh, we're not exactly, this is only like our second or third one that we've attempted. We appreciate everyone's participation. Uh, Relief Michigan uh, has been around for 32 years and we're a statewide nonprofit tree planting organization and uh, homeowner and technical education organization. So we strive to make available information to folks uh, that they might be interested in related to trees. Uh, we're very, very happy to be working with Janet and Steve. Uh, they've got a wealth of knowledge. And so um, looking forward to this presentation and ones to come. And we need to thank uh, the DNR and, and specifically specifically the uh, Urban and Community Forestry Program, which is headed by Kevin Sayers. A lot of you might have heard of him or know him, but he's a, a great supporter when it comes to uh, promoting education throughout Michigan. And this slide basically says what we do. We've been around over 30 years. We've got over 30,000 trees planted. And that might not sound like a lot, but we plant the larger ones. We don't plant the seedlings. And uh, we've worked uh, with over 400 communities from Calumet, Michigan, down to Monroe, over to St. Joe. So we truly strive to work with communities wherever we're needed on any kind of local tree-related projects. So with that, thank you very much for joining in. And we, I'll turn it over to Janet and Steve. Melinda is, is too, Melinda's too modest, too. You need to talk to, you need to get a hold of Relief Michigan if you've got tree planting things going on that you'd like to get going on in your community. Melinda has uh, received an award from the International Society of Arboriculture for her efforts doing these things. And she's one of the ones that started Relief Michigan and has been at it this whole time. So um, you're somebody who knows a lot about trees and shrubs and also how to make the communities make them grow. Go for it, Steve. All right, we start to look at reasons uh, why we want to use native plants and what to watch for in their planning and care. And we'll have a little bit of, of, uh, of a lineup of great choices involved. I'm Stephen Nicola. And with this cold and beard on, right? Yeah, I'm the, Janet McConovich. I'm the one that's usually wearing the suspenders and writing the words. And, and I'm that. usually doing the pictures. And now this is and our old we, We've been, yeah, this is our, our, our previous house, we've four years uh, been working on a new garden and a home that's new to us. But we got into natives in a big way, um, maybe the same way that some of you did. We looked and said, there's a lot of cool plants that are growing in the ditches and in the woods and in the fields around here. And I'd like to have some of those around. So for the cranberry bush viburnum is our, hat, is our hedge in our backyard. Uh, wonderful native fast growing shrub. We started planting a lot of natives for clients of ours. We are garden, we're professional gardeners and garden designers as well as educators. And so we would say, you know, in this place back here, we can put a, a, a striped maple, Steve's pointing it out to you there in the background, because it's a wonderful understory native tree. And the more that we put in natives, the more interesting um, butterflies and birds and things you get. And a lot of the people that we have are interested in that. So we've been doing this for a while. We broke up a, a native, 40-year-old fallen maple to make the edge of that garden that you just, you just saw. That's all right. Um, some of you know us too from the gardens that we, um, we spent 30 years gardening at the Detroit Zoo as volunteers. This portion of this garden is now underneath the new wolf exhibit, or we call it the new wolf exhibit. Um, it's been there for a while. But we were, um, we just loved bringing in things that were native and talking to people about them and teaching people about them. Uh, this is at the, the uh, Log Cabin Nature Center at the Detroit Zoo. Keep going, Steve. Yep. And it, we'll, we'll tell you about natives. The white pines here are native. Um, but there, we're, not, um, we're not going to tell you that the only thing you should plant is natives. There are people that are 
um, strictly native and that's not us. We think that there are places for every plant and we're going to talk about which is native and, and uh, we also are not sticklers about things like that is a uh, Canada Canadian hemlock you see in this picture and it is a weeping Canadian hemlock and there are people who believe that you know, these uh, varieties that we cultivate and, and keep going not by seed but by grafting etc don't count we're we're not sticklers for that so no we you'll hear we, that as we go along we love plants <laughs> and yeah. the things that the natives do that uh, help bring in the wildlife and, yeah. and and we've been educating people for a long time, from the time they're little on up, um, and, and a lot of adults uh, in, we are, most of our clients are in Michigan, but we do work in, in Massachusetts, in Wisconsin, in Illinois, in Ohio. Uh, we had this property um, that we designed and helped take care of in uh, San Bernardino area in California. And it's just opened our eyes to all of the different things that are available to us and, and that gardeners can make an impact on. And we like to share that with other people. Um, things like even looking up and going to botanical gardens in California to learn about the native plants there so that we could help these people plant more native plants and get more butterflies and birds in their, uh, in their yard. Go ahead, see the native and there. So we put that stuff in the, in the gardenatoz.org, which is our website. It's a labor of love. It's not a um, it's, it's not, there's no advertising, there's no cookies, there's no anything um, that we know that goes with it. It's just our stuff that we're writing and we're sharing with people because we think that that's the best thing that gardeners can do is share with each other. And that's why um, Melinda Jones at, at um, Relief Michigan contacted us. She said, if you got anything about native plants, we could teach people about native plants. And we said, great, we'd love to partner with you. So that's who we are and what we're doing here today. So we'll get going with natives, native plants in the landscape. We're gonna uh, focus mainly on trees and shrubs uh, during this. We, I, the handout has some perennial, the, a perennial list on it, uh, but there's not gonna be extensive number of images about perennials. No, we decided that we can only do just so much. So you have, um, this is three pages of the eight that are available for you. So you have lists of plants, uh, uh, trees for instance, with some footnotes on them and that's, uh, you can click, if you scroll through the chat menu, you'll find it says gear is a link to the note-taking outline because Janet can't type worth beans. But if you click on that link, you can download it. We'll show you as we go along where we are on it and we'll be, uh, we'll be hop skipping on the plant list because we can't cover all the plants we gave you. We just couldn't stop ourselves from giving you lots of them. Stephen, have you gotten into poison ivy? Yeah, something's happening on my left leg, shin. I don't know. I, All you gotta do is go to a warm climate. Normally, Steve and I are sitting next week. Everything that grows out here has a needle on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything. Steve and I are normally sitting next to each other when we do webinars, and currently he's in Arizona, and that's a long story, and I'm in Michigan, so I won't ask about what things you got into. Go ahead, Steve. Sorry if I'm moving too much, but I can't help it. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're, we're, this is where we're going to start uh, many reasons to use natives. Uh, and one of, the first, yeah, one of the first big reasons to use natives is because they're so well adapted. I think that's your next slide. Yep, they, they adapt to our climate adapted. They, uh, and, and yeah, by adapted, that's what we mean. We mean to things like the climate. Um, we've, having been in different places, we know that it does get cold and does frost in San Bernardino but it doesn't get the same kind of sustained cold that we get here. And here we get a long fall where it gets colder and colder and colder as, and plants are used to that and used to following that cue. Um, these plants that are native to this area have all of those cues built into their genes and can handle the stuff that is normally coming through here. That, that they, could, they could take the, the lighter, even heavy snows and they stand up to the winter. Those were the berries from the cranberry bush viburnum that was the hedge right before. Yeah, and, they will. Uh, yeah, and things Sorry. like yeah, and things like uh, leaf fall and leaf leaves changing color happen when the plant is native better than they happen in other places because the plant is set up to follow the cues and turn color at a particular time. This year we had a hard frost that came rather quickly, and. Um, I was surprised to see some of our native plants just drop their leaves green. Uh, I thought, wow, even native plants can get shocked by that, but it didn't kill them to do that. Yep. 
Uh, there are there are pockets of, of wind. There's way the winds come across, especially our area, the Great Lakes. Um, we're not in the plains. We may not have that heavy wind, but we get winds from various directions because sometimes we get nor'easters that the plains don't get. <laughs> and being wind tolerant doesn't mean that they're not going to get de deformed doesn't mean that they might not get buds killed back on one side from the wind, but it means that they've grown to be able to handle that kind of thing. Uh, and, and yes, we do get some windy stuff. That wind comes down yeah. from Canada. It can be pretty cold. There, um, you can see the wind catching those trees in the background there. That's at the um, uh, name of man, Steve, by the Ford headquarters in Dearborn. Yeah, it's the Ford, it's the Arboretum at the Ford World headquarters in Dearborn. I can't remember its name. With a great set of native plants there. It, they're great. all natives yep. to Michigan plants that they have around the building. And they, they were tagged the last time we were there. Yep. Um, so they're, but, drought, they're drought tolerant, but they're not, if they're native to the Great Lakes, they're not drought tolerant like the San Bernardino drought tolerant ones. They're not desert plants. Things no. that are native and drought tolerant for us are drought tolerant for a mesic climate, which means it's sometimes wet and sometimes dry. Um, they're, to they're tolerant of things like last, last summer, this past summer, we had a long period of no rain and there were a lot of plants that crisped right up, but the natives are going to come back from that better than the ones that are not able to handle that kind of thing. Even, yeah, and some adapt to, to to and what? <clears throat> Sorry. This is this is the picture that Steve said. Why did you put this one in here? I put this one in here because this red oak you can see, or if you if you look in the picture, you can see that there is a swale and a low area, and uh, chances are good that that red oak has got a, a good deal of roots in the moister swale than in the drier areas that are the pale lawn on the outside edge. It's not to say that all of the plants that are native to the, to the Great Lakes are. Uh, particularly drought tolerant. Some are more than others. It's a huge area of the Great Lakes and it does does pay to look and see what you're getting into. You want something really drought tolerant that's native? Hawthorns. Yeah, those guys, they're out there getting nothing ever, um, trying to kill everybody around them, but not gonna be killed by drought, not hawthorns. They, they, they're in medians that never get watered in, the, in there. Uh, our natives have we we have a lot of fast temperature swings sometimes and yeah like winter late winter at sunset sudden it's been a nice winter day it's 45 degrees and then boom the sun goes down and it's 22 degrees that's a huge swing and there are plants that can't handle that we have a hard time telling our San Bernardino client that this plant is acting like this in July because it was hurt by the cold in winter when the cold changed but this is, this is, you know, they, they just can't, I said, no, it's, it, this plant can't handle that big change. Ours can. Yeah. They can even freeze. They can freeze solid. Cranberry bush viburnum again. We do like that one. Yeah. Then we go back to it, summer. Our summers can be extreme and not, not. Um, they can go from being a soaking thunderstorm and a flood to dry in the next couple of months. Anyway. That's our native, yeah. so that they're climate adapted. I think they, and they can handle heat and immunity better than some of the other ones. They, you, the trees perform uh -huh. well, and we're adding natives to go with the trees now. Native perennials and ground covers. Yeah. One of uh, a maple leaf viburnum that can handle. One of Steve's cousin's favorite fires. plants. That one, maple leaf viburnum, nice understory plant. And of course, we've yeah. got things that are Michigan. hardy. We get winters and we get a lot of range of, of temperature swings, winter hardiness, uh, the white pines, how they, they adapt and do well. The firs, the way they protect themselves. We close we those get, buds right under, under all of those resin filled scales. Sometimes yeah. you kill all the needles on a plant, but the, the bud stays live inside. One of our favorite plants, you'll see a lot of, it, of pictures of it today because we the two of us kept bringing more pictures of it is the what's called Michigan holly if you live here in the Great Lakes but some people call it winterberry because it is native across a big swath of northeast United States. Um, it, it's a beautiful plant. It's a gorgeous it's plant. Spectacular in fruit. We'll get we'll show you more of it but 
it, it's so wonderful to walk through a native woods and, and see all the, the plants and the natives that are in there and how they handle the changes of, in here, they've not only been able to handle the winter, they've, there's 30% of these, we're seeing 30% less trees than used to be here because the ashes are gone. Yeah. And they've adapted to fill. There's new plants coming in to fill that, that are natives that are, have that opening. The coolest thing we saw on that walk, we've been walking in that particular woods, that's at Highland Recreation Area in Southeast Michigan. And we've been walking in that particular woods for 50 years, over 50 years now. And when the ash trees started falling and we lost lots of trees in there, hornbeams, our native hornbeams, sprung up from everywhere. And uh, they were probably seedlings that were sitting there in that nice sheltered place waiting for a little bit more light. And boom, so these hornbeams that normally are a little bit slower growing were five and six feet tall in no time at all. It's so very cool to watch that native stuff happening and the succession happening. Um, and and it, you notice differences even within a particular plant mm -hmm. species like spruce. You have the uh, Colorado blue spruce and the uh, uh, Norway spruce cultivars here, and then there's the white spruce. The the that the dwarf Alberta spruce. spruce can handle that cold, but not the dwarf Alberta. It 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 doesn't. It's amazing seem because the dwarf, the, uh, the dwarf the Alberta spruce, the white spruce, is uh is native to you know Alberta, Canada, and yet it's cultivar of can, so it's variable on all of these things. You do have to yeah. check the books. Yeah. But and we never want to see this. We never want to see. You shouldn't have to do this in, to any plant. Even if, they, even if somebody was doing that for salt protection, it wouldn't work, not to wrap it up like that. Yeah, you can't touch. Yeah. When, and no. Anyway, there, our soils are variable in Michigan. We have a lot of different soils and they could uh, adapt, but they, they will need help. We may have to add, leave the organics in. Let well, they them need, they need help. They need help because of what we've done to the soils more than anything else. Which I we think compacted them. Open think, them up. I think it's the next picture. Break them loose, yep. This is, um, even though it's native, and we've had some arguments with some of our native plant grower friends. Um, I think Bill Schneider is one of the ones. He says, no, just plant it. Don't amend the soil. I said, I can't do it, Bill. I cannot go out there where something has run back and forth with a, a bulldozer on top of wet soil and packed it down so hard that there's no air in it anymore and it's getting gray spots in it. I can't put a plant out there and hope it'll make it. I'm going to loosen up that soil because it's us that changed it. it. Yes, it's native Great Lakes soil, but somebody mashed it to where a plant can't grow in it. And so you, you might have to give it some help to get these in things. Some, in, in some areas, the, the topsoil is stripped and we're, it's subsoil we're working with too. Um, you know, almost completely stripped off. But get a soil test that's, um, it's, you it's wanna know what, what you have in your soil. A soil test really helps. It's great that in Michigan, we still have soil testing services available. Um, the, uh, the forms look a little bit different than this older picture that we have right now, but there are a number of extension services that have discontinued soil testing for people. You should soil test. It doesn't tell you whether your soil is compacted. It what it tells you is what nutrients you might need to add to that soil to get a plant going. And that's a great thing to have. And it's a great subsidized uh, testing service that you would have to pay quite a bit more for that service anyplace else. It also gives you the, the quantity so sand, silt, and clay that's mm -hmm. in your soil too, along with the percentage of organic matters. Yeah. And the, 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 they grow in their native soils, they grow healthy. These, this street, these streams of yellow here in the, App this is the Appalachian Mountains, but it's the yellow in the, the that's uh, Tulip poplar tree, and everything it you it follows where the water flows. They yeah, don't. What you're looking at, what you're looking at, are streams of yellow, but you're also looking at streams that on that hillside. That's where the creek runs. Those plants have chosen themselves. Some like it wetter, some like it drier. The tulip poplars like it and do better wetter. So they're following the stream, and it's pretty cool to watch that kind of stuff happening. You wouldn't notice when they're all green, but in the fall, you definitely see it. And That's if you correct. walk through, you would notice the change in the species and, and how some won't go farther down. They adapt to where they are. The, 
the, they perform well with with their native soils. If and uh, and and will turn a nice color. Uh, pin oak is native in the Great Lakes, but is not necessarily adapted to all the soils. We put them into soils that are um, that are very hard packed, that are too alkaline. And you may not notice this, but Steve and I both noticed that just from uh, 200 yards away, this tree is, is golden. It should be a dark green color. And what it is is chlorotic. It's not getting the nutrients it should get out of the soil. So they are, you might have to do some, you, might, you do have to do some looking to see where does this plant belong and put it in the right place. And you're um, needing to speed up, Steve. Okay, uh, we're gonna go to attractive and unusual. Um, is another reason to grow them. This is, it's just, they, they're different. Uh, they're attractive. The sugar maple is one of the most beautiful trees in the fall. And probably um, everybody knows about sugar maples, but they didn't know about nine bark until nine bark came out. And they go, wow, that's, that's, a, that's a neat plant. To tell someone that it's also a native plant makes it even more attractive. And then and this now, day, yeah. now we're working on improving if you think that way of, of some of the cultivars, there's going to be yellow leaved and orange leaved, leaved and purple leaved cultivars. Yep. The smoke bush is one of our favorite of the cultivars that are coming out of a lot of different, their fall color is spectacular. Uh, both Jan and I can do without the flower, but we love the fall color. That's our native smoke tree. That's, oh. that's the American smoke tree. The European smoke tree has little to no fall color, usually just kind of yellow and then the leaves fall off. Our native smoke tree is spectacular in the fall and it's a late color after other things have turned. So it's a nice thing to have. And it go from um, yellow to deep red. We call it smoke bush or smoke tree, same plant. Yep. And we, it, it, the, the natives add value to the landscape, especially as people are encouraging you to do more. Um, these are hornbeams. Yeah, Hackberry, yep. oh, went the wrong way. Hackberries, and they're, that's a big tree. That adds value to your landscape. It, it's, it's a, it's a well-grown tree. It's, it's fundamentally strong. It's, especially it's when you can there. tell people it was probably, especially when you can tell people it was probably there when the Native Americans were not aware that we were even coming, the, all of the settlers. And these two are the babies of this one. <laughs> <laughs> to have to have a tree, to have a native plant on the landscape, it does add value and it adds interest by for people who are looking at it. And we are getting more people interested in the natives in the public, and and they're starting to uh, the publications are encouraging people to look into native plantings and how to do that. And as you go th in various places in garden walks, there people are putting their signs out of what they're doing in their yard. This person was working on bringing back the American chestnuts that ha have been lost to blight. They'll get to a certain point and then just get the, the blight again. But it's, it's wonderful there. that people are interested and because people are interested, it means that more people are listening, looking, and if you plant natives, they're looking at you and, and applauding or asking questions and all of it's good. Those uh, roadside wildflower plantings are something that uh, has, that's in all oh, the last 30 years has been happening. And it does attract wildlife. They have planting natives. When, uh, what's that saying? If you plant it, they will come. If and you plant they will. It, they will come and they do. You, you plant a, a native plant and the, the fauna and, and that includes the insects that go with it show up. And when the insects show up, so do the birds show up, so do the um, larger animals. We might have uh, bad words to say for some of the animals that we attract, but it, you get a whole ecosystem when you get the native plants, including the ones that eat other ones. And you get insects. Um, you're gonna we'll get about this a little bit later. You're going to get insects when you plant any plant, and those insects need to be there. Plants are, plants evolved to be eaten. We can't, can't be um, trying to stop everything from eating every plant. We need to let these things live in balance and natives are a great way to learn all of that. And our native plants attract our native bees not, too. Yeah, some of our cool bumblebees on the asters. But it's insects a whole world to look at. And once we've got the insects, then you get the higher animals. Once you get the berries, you get the higher animals. 
Uh, they start to all goes together. I do love watching the robins and the cedar wax wings descend on the crab apples and pluck yeah. crab crab apples off of them. Uh, there's this, a lot of there's a lot of storytelling that goes with having natives in your in your on your property. Things that opportunities to tell people about turtle head and to show them that you can pinch the jaws of this uh, flower and it opens and shut this member of the snapdragon family. You can get kids hooked on this stuff and understanding a little bit more about ecology when you tell them that uh, you build a pond in your backyard and plant it with native um, plants that native insects grow with and frogs come to and dragonflies come to and the kids can see the entire cycle. That's, that's such a mind opening thing for kids that more people should be doing and uh, are beginning to do now. You take and a look at, stories. At, at lupine. Um, it's my, pardon me? It's my uncle Axel's lupin. That's what from. we call that, Uncle Axel's lupin. He lived in the, well, Steve's family came from up in Houghton Hancock in the Upper Peninsula. And Uncle Axel just loved lupins. Now this one that we're looking at right here is not native. But no, it, why? And the native one, um, the native one is our blue lupin, lupin lupinus perennis. They're named lupine, lupus. They're named after the wolf because people believed that um, wolves ravaged the landscape and that this plant ravaged the landscape because where it would grow, it would be big stands of just lupine and nothing else. Well, the truth is that lupine as a member of the pea family grows very well in nitrogen poor soils because it has nitrogen fixing bacteria uh, symbiosis on the roots. And so it can grow where other things can't. So it's not that the lupine is, ra is ravaging the land so much as it's growing where other things can't grow. But to tell people that this plant is named for a wolf and then to have them see the wolf claws in the uh, emerging flower is pretty cool. Yeah. And, and they, yeah, stories of, it, it could be an artist telling the story. It, sure, you capture the, the pictures fire. of the plants and the, and, and if you are from other places in the world, um, if, if you've traveled in other places in the world, you are trying to have our plants. So many people want to have our fall color from the Great Lakes. They want to have our daisies, our rudbeckias. Um, and yet, if we grow natives here, we can have a distinctive look for here. This is uh, dogwoods and azaleas. And Steve tells me a terrible thing. He tells me that the Masters Golf Tournament is on right now. And I am so used to all these years having people email or call me when the Masters is on to say, hey, Janet, how about if we put some azaleas in the landscape? And, and I go, oh, they must be watching the TV with the azaleas. But he tells me that the masters got moved to now. And I don't think I'll know what to do if I have to figure out why people are asking for azaleas now. But they said it's in fall. They said that? the course is in fall color now. It could be really spectacular. If those well, are azaleas that turn color. If they are, we're the we're the masters of color in the north part of the United States. And yeah. Circumpolar. But anyway, that's this is our look. This is more of our look. We, we do have native dogwoods. the Great Lakes region. Yeah. It's not wrong, it's not, it's, but we're. It's, it's beautiful and other people want those birches and they can't get them. They won't grow well for them. They get destroyed by insects or they, uh, they are, are weak growers. We're, we're very fortunate in Michigan, we think, Steve and I, that we have so many different zones and there are a lot of places in the world where uh, the climate zones are would cover the entire area, but because of the lakes around us, because of the separation between the upper and the lower peninsulas in, in uh, 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 elevation as well as in northern latitude, we have a lot of different areas to work with, including that 3B high point there at the uh, up in the, the middle tip of the middle finger and, and in the upper peninsula that sticks up further up than anything else. It's higher elevation and it gets all that cold Canadian wind coming down. It means that we have northern boreal forests up in the Upper Peninsula with all those evergreens. We have oak hickory woods. We have maple beech woods. We have incredible meeting of all of these places that got, um, that after the last ice age, plants from the Appalachian strongholds uh, recolonized our area, as well as from over further east coming off of the Canadian plant, uh, uh, Niagara Geo, um, Niagara Peninsula and whatever, we got all different kinds of plants coming. So we're, we're very fortunate to have a lot of zones and a lot of different native plants. We love oh, yeah. Michigan. Yes. Yeah. 
Lots of natives. Lots Fields, of meadows, stream sides. Our favorite little blue stem there. And they yeah. are, these plants are available. People ask us all the time, well, where can I buy them? Native plants are available at a lot of nurseries. Um, if you go online and search native plant growers, and I would suggest in Michigan, you go Michigan Native Plant Producers. You're going to find we have a Michigan Native Plant Producers Association that, as well as these, these um, growers that are growing native plants, and you can find them uh, and, and uh, contact them online. You'll find our native, our, our Michigan Native Plant Producers Association includes places like Wild Type uh, that are not only growing native plants, they are collecting the seed and growing those from native, native seed. Some of these plants, red maples, right, Steve? They're native all the way yeah. down into Georgia and oh, yeah. Florida. And, and it's, they're genetically different. Dogwoods. Species, yeah, dogwoods. A lot of our dogwoods at other nurseries are coming from nurseries that collected them in Tennessee and North Carolina, and they don't have the same hardiness adaptations that ours do. Whereas here our no local plant producers are collecting locally. They collect them locally, they grow them locally. Um, you're much more likely to get a native adapted to our area. Kentucky coffee tree, what a cool yeah. tree. Great. If you want to grow and try to grow one, get it from its local seeds in the dogwood too. Those are and, cool seeds. You actually have to drill a hole in them to get them to germinate. Yeah. Janet and I have been preaching for a long time that smaller is better. That's And, and be aware. And be aware from our, many of our native plant producer associations, you're not going to get those big six foot trees. You're going to get something that they have grown to fill and just to fill a one gallon pot or for uh, a four inch pot. You're going to get something smaller, but uh, we've shown, and you can look on our website and other uh, authors have done the same thing, that the smaller plant will outpace the bigger plant. There are reasons to put bigger plants out there if you're planting for a community and you're worried about vandalism. It's a lot harder for somebody to um, pull out of the ground a big tree than it is to pull out of the ground a little tree. So you might want a bigger tree in some cases, but wherever you can, choose smaller. If you have small plants, you can actually plant in between the roots of a tree like that. And you can't do it with a great big pot. And with a small plant, you have a better chance of getting that type of root system established. Yeah, that's a beautiful root grow. system. Flared out to the sides. Now, you might already have natives. Uh, if you're one of the many people that's working with your community and you're looking at a park or a natural area that you're um, adding more trees or, or, or tending the trees that are there, you might already have natives there. And it can really boost the appeal of an area if you start labeling them, if you figure out what they are and tell people what they are. Um, send, send, if you have a trail walk, send kids on a hike to find three or five or six trees or something that like that with our natives. And There's when lots of things we could do. Know, in order to identify them, there are people who say, I can't tell one tree from another. And I, I do remember um, 40 years ago, more than 40 years ago, I remember I would drive down the road and all I would see were trees. That's all, trees. Now we drive down the road and I see maples and hickories and oaks and I, I've seen the differences between them. And I know that, they're, that, that it can be hard to look and say, what is that? But flower is one way to tell and is one very telling way to tell. If you're looking at some of the good books like um, uh, Gary Heitchew's Native Trees, Shrubs and Vines for Urban and Rural Rome, America, it's going to give you descriptions and drawings of the flowers. Or um, you can uh, look up online, which is great now. You can take a picture of the flowers of maybe you found a uh, Eastern Wahoo, our native Uwanimus burning bush relative. Maybe you've taken pictures of the flowers. You can actually go online now and go to something like Google or Bing, put the, drag the picture into the images field and find other images that look like it and help you figure out what that plant is. But the flowers are distinctive. They're very distinctive. They're not there for a long time, but they're very distinctive. And, and the way that you can tell what something might be, that's one way. And because they're not there for a long time, it's not the, more, the best of the ID characteristics, but it is a good one to have. Fruit tends to be there a little bit longer and is also distinctive. Um, Steve and I argue all the time about partridge berry, partridge berry versus uh, wintergreen. 
And oh. really the only way we can tell the difference is by looking at the fruit. There's this little, there's this little mark on the partridge berry fruit because they're two, two formed together. Um, anyway, so you can look at the fruit and fruit includes things like the seed pods on the sweet gum. Or the cones, the, the distinctive the cone. cones of the Douglas, Douglas fir. fir. Yeah, very distinctive cones. And you, you see a maple seedling once, you know maple seedlings, or seed pods, sorry, the maple. Seed. How many people have grown up throwing maple seedlings in the air and watching them spin? And bark is distinctive. I know that there's someone in the audience today who's been out on bark identification with us, looking at things and making up names that say, let me see, it's sycamore. It's an upchuck tree. Up, look up, and it starts breaking up into pieces. So sycamore has smooth bark further up, smooth, almost white. And then it starts getting chucked up as you come further down. And it's very, it's very distinctive bark. I learned recently, Steve, that it's also very good. The reason that the sycamore and the plane tree can handle pollution is because they shed bark. The, po the, uh, the pollution that was the problem when we started bringing plane trees over was the pollution from gas burning and oil burning things. So there was a lot of black smudge in the air. And when it gets on the bark, it clogs up the, the bark's ability to breathe and grow. But if it sheds bark all the time, then it's cleaning itself off all the time. Wow. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Plants, amazing things. Barks could look similar, but there's different uh, aspects to them that you, you learn to look at and to see. And because uh, there are authors that have published books of just the uh, of identification of trees and shrubs showing you the bark, that's another thing you can go online for, a picture of the bark, and it'll tell you the differences between um, the, the gray of service berry and those that five-color the... breaking up of the Washington hawthorn. Yeah. And, and I wish we could do that to the beaches. Yes, but... we will do that to the beaches. But smooth mm. gray on red maple, smooth gray on service berry, smooth gray on beach. They mm. tend to draw that kind of attention. I love the smooth gray of red maple when it, when it flowers with its little red flowers in the spring, that gray bark yeah. of those red flowers. Now the leaf will tell you what things are and there are some apps, um, programs that you can go to like Snap It and, uh, oh no, I've forgotten the name of some of them that are run where I can, you can take a picture of a leaf and put it into this app to learn what kind of leaf it is. And they are distinctive, for instance. The, the elm has a, a very unique base like that. The elm yeah. does that and, and it also has what's called a double serration. You could see two cuts in each leaf for this elm in each particular. Each tooth has but teeth. But it's the base, it's the base in particular that it's unique in the elm, a good ID. And for, use, and for using these apps, it's going to be important that you know something about what is a leaf. We were looking at a leaf of an elm a minute ago. We're now looking at a leaf with five leaflets of a pig nut hickory. There's words that and if, if you were to put just one of those leaflets into those apps, it might return you telling you that it's a cherry. Or magnolia. That, or a, yeah, a magnolia. This looks magnolia. <laughs> yeah, you need to have all of the leaf. And the way to tell that it's a leaf is to go back to the bud that it grew from. If that whole thing is gonna drop off as one, it is one leaf and it goes back to where Steve's pointing to you where the, to look for, if you're going to use the leaf apps to identify plants, go back to the point where they emerge from the bud each year and take that whole set of leaves, leaflets. And fall color can help. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's true. And they, the leaves are just... They're beautiful. They are beautiful leaves. Even, even the shape, in the spring. The shape, the fuzziness on the leaf, whether the backside is hairy or... They're all things that are, are, are there and described in books like Mike Durr's Manual of Woody Landscape Plants. I'm going to step off for just a minute, Steve, you keep going. Okay. And then uh, you, could, you could use Durr's to get ideas of, of the color and the size of the leaf. But our, the most important characteristic of identification is something that's there all the time. It's the buds. The buds, you could find the buds. They, they're arranged in two different ways, uh, well, three different ways. There's opposite, there's a sub-opposite that they're very close to opposite. I don't have an image of that, Katsura uh, 
uh, is one of those that it's a sub opposite. And then this is the alternate, the leaves go on are alternate, not directly across from each other. So if I look in, and I'm not, I can't remember whether we put it on the handout, um, Michael Durr's Manual of Woody Landscape Plants. This is the Bible of trees and shrubs. It does Close have non-natives as well as natives. But if I, if I just randomly open up to a page, I'm going to find that it's showing you what the leaves look like, how they're arranged, and there's a text that tells you more about it. Better even than that, though, and something that I just think if he never does anything else, if he never did anything else in his career, Gary Heitschut's Manual of um, Native Trees, Shrubs, and Vines for Herbal and Rural America. This book is out of print, but find it. If you are into native plants, find this book. If, if I you want to know where, where they grow, what kind of conditions they like, where they're native in so the I country. Can, I can open to the page for whatever this one is right here. So it's the American chestnut. What a great one to open to. It's going to show me what the overall shape of the plant is, um, what the arrangement of the leaves are and the fruit, what parts of the country it's native to, and all of that's going to be described there too. So you'll be able to figure out what your plants are. It's kind of a fun thing to do in the winter using Steve's buds. Um, because and the buds, the, the very distinctive. Very distinctive. The, the, the way they're arranged, the scales, the scales that are on the buds, um, the, the description will say a, a pointy, pointy, long, pointy, and it's got five or seven scales. Um, they sometimes will be a naked bud with, without a scale. This rock elm does have a sc scales on it. Anyway, or, they're cool. Might, this, the buds might not be visible on Kentucky coffee tree and on the uh, locust trees. The buds are sunken right into the bark, which is one of the reasons that these trees are so salt resistant. It's because the buds aren't sitting out where salt can rest on them and dry them out before they start growing in the spring or as they start growing in the spring. And even the bud scar, so we're looking at the terminal bundle scar right there. That's where the leaf stalk was attached last year. And that's distinctive. This is great stuff to do. And, uh, and it is, is worth looking at to see what you have, what the fruit looks like, the cones. The arrangement of the needles uh, yeah. that the needle has in a pine, it has two, three, or five needles coming out of one little cup on the twig. And you could tell, you just say it's a two needle pine and you get a list of pines and yeah. three needle or five needle. This is a white pine, it's a five needle pine. It and firs, you look close, they come right out of, with no cup, they just come right out of the stem. If fir, and then the spruce has a little cup that they come out of, one needle. So if it has more than one needle, it's a pine, at least in our area. And if it has a little cup with a needle coming out of it, it's a spruce. And then, it's, then it could be a fir. And then there's a whole bunch of others that- You could you stop can... now. You could stop now. <laughs> I want you to know that our kids heard us talking about this while Steve was in college for horticulture. Um, we would be driving down the road arguing about what a plant was, and our kids would say, enough, stop, stop. Yes. I However, they were the same kids who we heard when the neighbor said that pine tree over there, since everybody calls everything evergreen a pine, they said that pine tree over there, and our six-year-old son said, that's a spruce. So they're listening to us. Yeah. Also, oh. thorns and other things can tell us what's up. Moving along. And okay. We have to be careful. Yeah. You know, don't, they, don't, don't let anybody tell you, don't believe any of that hype that says that they're super plants, because they're not. They're just plants that if you put them in the right place, you're going to create a native ecosystem around the berries, the fruit, the leaves, the timing of the plant. Um, but they can also get diseases. So They'll get, uh, they'll get sick. Monardas can get leaf funguses. Groundhogs will munch on woodland flocks. Deer will eat woodland flocks. Um, Potentilla, native all over the, uh, the mitten, is, uh, it's got ugly seasons. It's not forever, no matter what it says in the books about blooms all summer. Uh, this is July and it's kind of looking a little bit um, peaked at this point. That's yeah, up on Waukesha's point up at the, the top of the mitten um, and just growing completely by itself. I wonder whether those are okay, Steve. Those are underwater now. 
No, they are. I, yeah, I didn't see any point, sign the of them. water level is so high. It's amazing. Where we used to walk, we can't walk anymore. So they're not super plants. If they're if the area is well designed, if you say to yourself, "What have I got? Do I have wind? Do I not have wind? Do I have companions of other kinds of plants? Do I have a soil that is more sandy or more clay?" If you match the plant when you're doing the design to put the right plant in the right place, whether it's native or not native, you're going to have a better landscape. At our, our um, previous house in our rain garden here in the front, outlined by the horseshoe of rocks in the front, we lowered that area so that we could track the water that comes down to that area and into that area put native plants that like the wet. Um, the big leaves that you see there are prairie dock which is a wonderful native plant. We also have blue flag iris and some other things. And in the long run, given um, the maintenance that, uh, that favors the plants that are there and putting them in the right place, this is what happened is the prairie doc said, okay, this is my place. I can take over um, if you put it in the right place. It's a beautiful place at the edge of and even in the water to put prairie doc. And it's a great plant. We love prairie doc. It's All there, the way, um, those sway in the in the wind, and then the yellow goldfinches on them too, eating the seed. Yeah, the great big, uh, big tall stalks with sunflowers up at the top, and they bloom at the perfect time for the goldfinches, who have fledging their their uh, nestlings at the time, to come out and teach them what to eat. So there's always goldfinches all over them. It's a great native plant, and to do that you have to take into account the fact that they're not lower maintenance, no matter what people tell you. It's not lower maintenance, it's a different maintenance. If you plant a native plant, you're asking it to take care of itself. You're saying, in this area, black cherry belongs, that's the one on the right. Yeah. Sorry, Steve. Black cherry. And the maples, the, the red maples belong. In the background, there's a Norway maple. And you, as, a, um, as the gardener or designer or the, the caretaker of an area, would say, I think I'm gonna favor and take out the Norway maple seedlings until these native plants get a leg up and take charge of the area. And that's a different kind of maintenance. Um, it might be that you're going to let there be ice breakage. Let it break, cut it back, let it grow back. Shrubs need to grow new stems. That's the difference, the biggest difference between a shrub and a tree is that they grow more stems over their lifetime than a tree does. And they do, need, they do need maintenance and they do need management. They do need water, especially water, that whole first year after you put them yeah. in, make sure they don't dry out. Don't think just because they're native or they like the soil that they don't need the moisture. They need the water. And, and, and it means that you're going to be, if, if you are as into it for all the reasons that natives are good as we are, it means that you're going to remember that you put that plant out there so that the monarch butterflies could lay their eggs on it. And that means you're not going to use pesticides around them. And that's a different mindset to say, I'm not going to spray this with anything. I'm going to let it take care. I'm going to give it water. I'm going to give it sun. I'm going to give it the right soil. And I'm going to let things eat it because I'm that's what I got the, it for. And I'm going to let the predators come in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ladybugs. Well, I don't know that everybody knows that that ladybug is a predator, Steve. That this, ladybug can eat 30 aphids a day. Um, probably clean up this area right there. We should ask uh, Relief Michigan to bring the, the, the bug lady in from Pennsylvania, the uh, Penn State professor, who takes the mini videos of insects and shows a ladybug stomping along, three strides, grab an aphid, bite the belly out, throw the aphid to the side, bite another belly out, throw the aphid to the side. Horror movie. They're, Horror they're, movie. Yes, it's, it's wonderful to watch this stuff happening around natives. Um, and it might be that you have to start looking for, so where are the non-natives, in this case, um, Dame's Rocket, or uh, what else is it called? Dame's Rocket, Sweet Rocket. It's a uh, mustard family plant that the uh, colonists brought over, and it can get carried away, so you might have to learn to identify it and pull it out. There are many places that you can go and talk to um, people in different, at different nature centers or different parks where they're doing eradication of invasives, and what they do is, is get a line of people and walk through picking everything that you see out because it's important to keep the invasives out until the natives get a chance to get going. Yeah, get, being native there. As a woody, bittersweet is the one that's really- That's a tough thing. Yet a whole line of people go through the whole state right now. Yeah. <laughs>
and, and, and you, have, you have native plants children. Plants move around. They and, do. And, the na the, and, and some of the shrubs need to move too. They'll... You need to know their nature, that the foam flower in the bottom left corner is a, uh, is a traveling ground cover like uh, strawberries. It's going to put out runners and pop up in different places. Like and over there. It, it might put its runners right into the middle of something else that you're growing. And you need to know its nature to know what belongs where. Hi. What's native there? The trillium are native and the foam flower was native. The golden bleeding. Uh, is, is the black jack native? No, blackjack is a Japanese uh, um, jack okay. in the pulpit. And the How many times have we shown this picture? I just saw that. Okay. Yeah, but the trillium and the toll flower. So There's... When, when, if you're involved in one of these kind of projects where you take out uh, an area of, of mowed turf and put in wildflowers, it helps to know that someone needs to make sure that the mowed turf doesn't spread back into that area because it will. If it was there first, it must have been surviving on its own and can compete out compete your natives. And then people start dissing your natives that you spent all the time getting put in because they say, oh look, it's just a messy thing. So the, they, the, they, biggest, the biggest okay. thing about natives that I've noticed is that is that establishment period where they are um, even in in shrub plantings and perennial plantings, they they look messy because they take time to get established and the weeds move back in. Eight minutes, Steve. Okay, sorry. Okay, Ball Pole Island, they burn, things come on. People put in tiger eye sumac, they have to know it's suckers. People say, what do I do with the suckers? Should I cut them out? No, you put in a suckering shrub tree, let it sucker, that's what they do. Or put it in a pot. <laughs> and understand that they get, get big. That, that low growth sumac, that plant can be that large and spread that far. And it's healthier when it does. And we just um, mentioned the establishment. You've got to water. You've got to water and care and weed. Native, native perennial plants taking off at the uh, University of Michigan's uh, Nature Center. Lindira is our native spice bush blooming yellow there in the woods where it naturally belongs. Um, it's going to grow very well in a partly shaded area in the wet, but you're going to have to give it some help to do that in a, in a normal landscape. Our, and the our, canadensis. our native dogwood that runs along on the ground um, needs some help. It needs lots of organic matter to get going. So what native plants we've we got for you are on the lists, and we're going to go quickly through some of those to show you what they look like. You're looking at uh, cranberry bush viburnum there. We have lists of first starting with ones that are commonly used, like red maple. Red so unfortunately, maple. if you're one of the people that's planning for a big planting, don't plant a lot of maples. We're heavy on maples having lost our ashes and our elms and, and, and other things. So don't plant too many maples because then we're just asking for maple problems to hop, skip, and jump across a big planting. Yes, that's and, a good you know, point. Yeah, people just love to pick up a sugar maple. But serviceberry. Serviceberry, what a wonderful plant. Great flower foliage. Uh, yes. The fall color is spectacular. Um, and the fruit, I forgot that the yeah, fruit our, of the service. Our grandkids love to climb the, climb the ladders and pick the fruit. Um, red buds are, are native um, through the, the lower half of Michigan. Uh, upper half, you're, they're not going to grow. And they are they're beautiful trees, and they're available in different types. There, we do have... Uh, native flowering, dogwood. Flowering dogwood is native in Michigan, up to about yeah. Bay City, Saginaw. We and, see it in Highland Rec. Yeah, it's a, it's a gorgeous tree. Very yeah. nice layered understory tree. Fruit, and and fruit on it. Color. Our American beech, a big majestic tree. And we said that the cultivars are coming of these. Here's, a, here's beeches in the nursery, and there are probably 50, and that's conservative guess, 50 cultivars or varieties of European beech, weeping and purple and pygmy and, and uh, um, lace leaf. And yet of our American beech, we haven't even and begun to start selecting things on it. There's a lot you can look at there. Maybe the beech. Yeah, I love the foliage, especially when it first coming out. It's so beautiful. Our witch, witch hazels, we have uh, spring blooming, fall blooming witch hazels. 
Now, most of the spring blooming witch hazels that you find at the nurseries are um, hybrids of the southern witch hazel crossed with the Asian hardier witch hazel that we can grow. But most of those yeah. spring blooming ones are not technically native in Michigan. The, witch the, hazel the ones that are have much smaller flowers. They don't have the bigger showy flowers, right? Yeah. <laughs> And our native one all throughout Michigan is the fall blooming witch hazel, which sometimes is blooming yellow at the same time that its foliage has turned yellow and people miss that it's flowering at all. But the bees don't miss it. The bees know the scent, the scent is still there. It's very fragrant. Yeah. So it's hard very to tell whether it's flower or foliage. Yeah. Black walnut has, uh, you know, it's a, a lullo. A lullapath. A lullapath. Or but... a lillapath, yeah. It, it, it means it has that, a beautiful shape, and it's really a quite a nice tree. I think I I like them. I mean, they are they are big, wonderful trees, and the fact that some things don't grow with them, plant them where it's wetter. The more water there is, the more things grow with them. Larches are beautiful. People always think after the needles fall off that it's a dead spruce, and they'll send us emails once in a while that say, "What killed all the spruces along I seventy five up by Gaylord?" Well, they aren't spruces, they're larches, and they just drop their needles, that's all. And they're doing this right now, right this minute outside. They're larches, larches, bald cypress, and, and metasequoias are all dropping. And then our white pines. We have so many white pines in our state. And go, go. some of them get... Very picturesque. Like, don't, we don't need to talk about that right now. So okay. <laughs> and there's cultivars. Yep, weepers. We mentioned the sycamore and the bark and how it could be a big tree. This is the tree that follows the rivers for us. And yeah. see what Papa does. Down in White Kentucky. Oaks, too. People, people don't plant oaks because they say, oh, they take too long to grow. They don't take too long to grow. Oaks put into the right place, the red oak will grow 18 inches a year. White oak will grow 12 inches a year, 15 inches a year. They're, they're a lot faster than you think they are. Don't put them in compacted soil. Isn't it nice to know that you planted something that 400 years later, that broke is going to be there. 400 be years awesome. old. Yeah. Awesome trees. And they have, each oak has its own characteristics and shape that you can appreciate. Oh, we have hemlocks that. in Michigan. Yeah, people uh, say hemlocks don't grow in Michigan. Nonsense. They're native in Michigan. Um, a lot of the hemlocks we get from nurseries have uh, root systems that are compromising them, but they grow in Michigan very well, and there are varieties, weepers and dwarf ones. Yep. And we and like the canadensis. We love the sergeant, the creeper. Some of the shrubs that are very readily available, red twig dogwood is native all around the, our latitude, all around the, the, the pole. Um, and again, there's more cultivars of that. You could get all different colored twigs now, it seems like. Oh, yeah. yeah and cardinal. we did tell you about the Michigan holly and, and we love it. It's just, it is a, it you is a, do need male, female plants. On the hollies. Fruit. And it is a suckering shrub. There are people who would say, why would you want to plant that? It becomes a thicket. It's a suckering shrub. These are things you want to learn about, things you want to look in a, in a book that tells you how that plant grows and shows you whether or not it's a mounded individual plant or whether it's a suckering plant like the uh, ilex is. You can look through and look at the vines. That's the ilex fruit, and then the leaf goes yellow with that red fruit. It could be spectacular. Yeah. And potentilla, a, a steady eddy. People, and, people say, oh, they're just, they're wonderful plants. They're wonderful plants. They're so adaptable. They'll bloom off and on all year. The bees love them. Um, you can cut them down to the ground and let them grow back, and they still bloom. What a great native and plant. They they might get twiggy, but they don't get big and twiggy where they take over everything. They're great for along a driveway or in a parking lot where you occasionally need to just mow everything down because uh, they've gotten in the way of like snow clearance or something. Fragrant sumac, good along highways or other places where you need a big ground cover because remember, it does not want to fit in those little foundation plantings. It, it won't do well. It, it is fragrant in all parts too. Yeah, the we like the viburnums. Um, the it's the unfortunate sunburn. that the uh, it's unfortunate that the viburnum leaf beetle has moved into our area, and all of the viburnums that have a smooth leaf are tending to get terrible decimation. But chances are that we're going to be able to start planting them again. Give it five to ten years. In Pennsylvania, they've where the 
elm leaf, the uh, viburnum leaf beetle came through first, they're beginning to find that there's less damage as the native uh, birds and whatever start learning to eat the elm, the viburnum leaf beetle. But temporarily, you might want to hold off on using the cranberry bush viburnum with its smooth leaves and, yep. and look for viburnums with a, 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 a fuzzier leaf on them. Oh. Other like weed viburnum type, but the Not cranberry bush viburnum has just beautiful fruit fall color that nobody eats until the spring. Yeah. Then there's a few that are more. Uh, we've given you a list of things that are a little less used, but are definitely worth looking for. Um, like striped striped maple. maple. This is a tree that will grow three feet a year, sometimes more than that. Um, beautiful yellow fall color, nice striped bark, uh, good understory tree. And people don't know that it's out there or that it's native. Um, so you need to look around a little bit for some of these. And if you're into that unusual stuff. And the Florida dog dogwoods, uh, the pagodas is, is probably, in my opinion, a, a more beautiful tree as much as I like them both. But this one with the blue fruit with the red. Uh, red pedicels on it. Pedicel, yeah. e oh, e it's hard to beat. And it's characteristic, the very horizontal. The regular dog, the Florida dogwood isn't quite as horizontally branched as this one. Probably the only thing I was disappointed about with pagoda dogwood, this is a variegated pagoda dogwood. Is that a beautiful variety or what? Um, is that the deer, boy, they do like to eat it. You know, when you get these native plants, you have to protect them till they get big enough. Kentucky coffee tree. Um, very coarse in texture. And this picture is at Hidden Lake Gardens, where you can look at natives in the, in the wetlands area where the Kentucky coffee tree is. Yeah, there are, cool. um, for people who don't like the uh, pods and fruit on some of the trees, uh, you can choose for, you know, on the Kentucky coffee tree, for male cultivars that don't have the fruit. And our, our native, native linden. Yeah. Not the little leaf linden. <laughs> no, That's no. Big tree. And they grow on the dunes. Maybe. That is one tree there in a copse because the trees get buried. These lindens are adapted to growing on our dunes. The dunes will actually cover them up and those are branches of one tree that have all rooted. Now this one, the dune has moved on. Uh, the dune has moved on and now the roots that grew out from the trunk and made it a multiple tree are exposed and I'm standing underneath them. I mean, that is the coolest thing in the world and that's our native basswood which is also great um, uh, carving wood. And that's what this uh, um, basswood is doing in the, in the median, uh, out in the outlawn here in this strip. We've exposed the roots because they were, it was buried, the trunk was buried all the way up to the stain that you see, which is not good for it. But it had busily rooted in all directions. Well, we told the owner that they should dress it up for Halloween. So the black claw viburnum has a fuzzier leaf on it than the cranberry bush viburnum. It's actually much more toward of a tree. People tend yes, to think it's of a larger ball. Plant. Yeah, don't think of shrubs as all dumpy and, and sleepy and, grope, and uh, uh, grumpy, and, you know, the dwarfs. They, they're big. This is, uh, takes the place of 20 a 20-footer. Yep. Yep. Elderberries. I love elderberries for summer bloom on them with the big white flowers, a nice scent. And the birds love the fruit. Uh, they do well in gardens. You do have to remember with elderberry that you must prune out branches. You've got to let it grow new canes or the borers will destroy it. Now our list of herbaceous... We, we gave you a list. Right. We gave you a list of perennial wildflowers and those that are in bold are ones that are easier to find, um, like the butterfly weed that's become very, very common now, whereas you'll have others that are not in, uh, in bold and those are a little harder to find with codes there to tell you whether they're S for sun and SH for shade. But we're not going to take you through those. We're just going to, uh, you know, one by one, we'll just show you a couple of pictures and say, why, why wouldn't you want May Apple in your woods? Beautiful native brown cover. Why wouldn't you want the Catalpa? June flowers, fragrant, big leaves, wonderful tree. Why wouldn't you want to grow that? Culver's root. The first time you come across Culver's root, you go, what is that? Same thing Especially with Especially in the winter when it's black. Yeah, in the winter it turns black. It's very cool. Fathagillas, they get bigger than advertised. Yeah, they're shrubs, they're not. Now what is native? It's hard to say. Most people go by what was here before the European colonists came in, but there are still arguers about that because 
even the, the native peoples move things around. Oak leaf hydrangea native in the woods. Staghorn sumac out in the open. Right on the edge and it will run and it can be gorgeous. I love them. If you don't want it to run, put it in a walkway. Right, this is the lace leaf staghorn sumac. Yeah. Then there's tiger eye with the gold lace leaves. That turn that spectacular. That's what I love them for. That's what I love them for. So let's look and see what kind of questions people have about natives here. Do I have? Oh, I don't Ashley know and Ash, um, I can scroll back through the chat too, but Ashley and uh, Melinda have been watching the chat here and know if there are questions that have come up. I have a couple questions here. Um, the first one was, Will, what are your thoughts on volunteer ash trees living? Are saplings worth keeping or will they eventually still succumb to the emerald ash borer? Um, I hope, Southeast Michigan. I hope that the ash borer, like some of our other pests, Japanese beetle for instance, might become something controllable that are we lost so many trees so quickly because we didn't realize it had been introduced. We had thousands of ashes cheek by jowl next to each other, all of them in rather poor condition because they were growing in, in the tough places we put ashes and we just set ourselves up for a huge invasion. I'm hoping that we're going to be able to start growing ashes sometime in the, in the future, but we have some volunteer ashes on our property now, Steve's and I, and I'm killing them. I'm girdling them because they're going to die. I don't want them to get real big. I'd like to keep them, uh, right now they're oh, maybe six inches in diameter. It's a big enough trunk that it could provide some um, places for birds to make homes in the wood as it dies, but I, I'm not looking to keep them yet. I think that's still off in the future. What do you think, Steve? Be willing to try, except for where there, it, it, we don't have the room, first of all, and I don't need bigger trees falling. If I had a big piece of property, I would let a few come and see what happens. Yeah, let's watch. We see. don't know. I don't, I don't think, I think the insect's still there. Oh, I'm sure the insect is still there. I just think that there may be some things to do um, with isolates, like the, uh, some of the American chestnuts that lived through the blight that killed two billion plus trees in the 1880s and the early 1900s. We had some, we have a piece of a chestnut that was still alive in Michigan seven years ago, and then lightning struck it. Um, and we have a piece of that tree, but that tree was probably still alive because there were no chestnut forests around it to carry the blight tree to tree to tree. So it could be if you have the only ash anywhere around, maybe your ash is going to make it. That's true. Thank you. Uh, what about service berry? Do you know of any major disease problems for those trees? Yeah, um, they do get scab. Like, uh, like crab apples and apples do. So you might uh, see leaves falling off of them in the middle of summer because the leaf has, developed, has too much of the fungus in it and the tree is letting that leaf go. It's not gonna kill the tree, but it can be disfiguring to look out and see dead leaves laying in the, in the springtime. Um, we found with almost all of the trees that, that are on our beat, if we water them well and fertilize well, we get much less scab infections. Um, and that's because the tree is able to mature the leaf and seal itself up quicker rather than sitting there getting infected over and over again in the early springtime. So scab is, is probably the only thing. What else? Uh, that's really the only, the only problem that we've seen with service. Yeah. Other than the fact that people grow them, um, growers grow them because they say people want them as clump trees, they'll stick a bunch of service berries together into a pot to make that multi-stemmed tree. And as these trees grow with their seven, eight, nine trunks, they kill each other. So the tree gets up to 15 or 20 feet tall and suddenly the center dies because the center trunk has been squeezed out by the other trunk. So if you get multi-stemmed service berries, thin them down early on to just a few trunks with room to grow, imagining that those trunks are gonna get this big around. Those are our two big problems with service berries. Yep. 
Okay, and this is the last question I have right now. Are hybrid beaches as susceptible to beach bark disease? That I don't know. That I do not know. Um, beach bark disease is an awful thing. It's, I, I, I sometimes want to just put my head down and back into a closet and close the door and not hear about any more diseases and invasive insects that are moving in. And these diseases are in fact invasive organisms too, things that weren't here before. I just don't want to know about another blight, another disease, another, um, and beach bark disease is terrible, but I, I do not know whether um, there are some that are more resistant than others. Yeah, terrible thing. Um, what about, so we have, Jeremy said he's losing about 30 spruce trees that were functioning as a wind block, needle cast and gypsy moth um, were the culprits for that. Any suggestions for native replacements? Well, of our, uh, if you're looking for a wind block, then I would, I would recommend if you want to block the wind that you plant not one kind of tree, but multiple kinds of trees. And you start with something lower and and bushier hawthorns, for instance, great in the wind, real twiggy trees. Start with hawthorns and then go higher and denser so that you're pushing the wind up. Um, I I would also and in natives, um, our white spruce is a very nice thing to use. Um, uh, what is the pine that we've got? Red pine is a good one to use if you want evergreens out there to be the evergreen portion of a windbreak. Um, I would also, just for everybody that, that is looking at their spruces, question whether needle cast is killing them. I would question that when people tell you, look, it's got needle cast. Most of the time when we look at spruces that are declining, they're declining because their roots are girdled. Just like we learned that Norway maples roots uh, have a tendency to circle. And at, when the trunk gets as big as the original circle of roots, they run into the circle and, and uh, circling root and they die. We're seeing that right and left with spruces, that it's not needle cast, but um, look down, look at the root problem first. If you so, don't see flares, even on a spruce, there should be some flares coming out. If, if yeah. it's going straight in the ground, go, you might have to dig around and try to see, you might actually see a root going around a trunk and that stops the flow to the needles and the needles start to die. Yeah. And then the tree dies. It's a sad thing to see them die. Can you talk a little bit more about the problem with putting burlap on evergreens? Um, we find that um, we feel that burlap on evergreens is a problem because we're planting evergreens as designers because we want to see the green in the wintertime and then to have people put burlap around them just which is brown yeah it just negates the whole purpose of the plant but in addition to that people wrap burlap around plants and if they're trying to protect them from the wind wrapping them doesn't protect them from the wind it in fact can make them chafe more because as the burlap moves in the wind then the foliage and the twigs are chafed as well if you want to break the wind you go upwind of the plants at least several feet and put a windbreak in of burlap. You don't wrap the plant itself. If people are wrapping bur burlap around because they're trying to keep salt away, same thing. If the salt lands on the burlap and the burlap is touching the needle, then there's no protection there. The salt is still gonna be able to draw moisture out of the needle. So salt protection needs to be further away. And some of the best salt protection can be a good planting of some of our native grasses. Put panicum out there, the switchgrass, and, and let the switchgrass intercept the salt that's spraying off the road or wherever it is that's coming from. And then you just cut the switchgrass down in the spring and cart that off to let that uh, decompose someplace else. It's caught the, the salt that's there. So we don't like the look of it. And we see that there, it's being used for reasons that don't, that don't add up, that don't make sense. If they're being wrapped because um, uh, deer eat them, that's another matter. And in that case, I'd like to see them wrapped with something lighter that air can get through, that air and water can get through, like a floating road cover, which would also keep the deer from eating it. So sorry about that. Yeah, we, we get on our soapbox about burlap and we forget that other people have not been around while we've been talking about burlap in other uh, 
presentations and in our articles. It's part of what you want the right plant in the right place and evergreen should be able to withstand the wind if you put it in its proper place. If you research the plant where it likes to grow, you should be able to pick its spot better. And so you shouldn't have to protect it. Yeah. No more questions? Uh, one more. What about your favorite native trees to be used for street trees? I love hackberries. I think hackberries are one of the most wonderful trees. Um, they have, uh, they don't give you fall color. Um, they do have a deep corky bark, but they grow very well. They're healthy. They have one insect that sometimes bothers people. There's a gnat that can live with them. And sometimes in, this, in some summers you can have a lot of these gnats hatch out at one time and you know how you walk out and go, God, there's all these little things all over. But other than that, nothing happens to hackberries. They, um, they're just, I just, that huge tree that we showed you is a hackberry that was probably 300 years old. Um, and we, anyway, I love hackberries as a street tree. Okay, I think we have a follow-up question to Paul, I hope you're talking about the hackberries. If not, correct me, but is there a recommendation for distance from foundations for putting those in? Um, we have a, a recommendation for distance from a building, and it's based on, for us, Steve and me, we like to put trees far enough away that the branches can just reach the building. We don't like to see the branches overhanging the building, um, if, if at all possible. And that generally keeps the roots um, a ways away, but generally is, okay, the roots of the trees go way further than the branches go. So even if I put a, a hackberry that's going to be in, in my lifetime or, how, or my tenure on the property, this hackberry is going to be 40 feet across. So I put it 20 feet out from the building. Um, once that tree gets established, its roots are probably going 60, 80, 100 feet away from the tree. And they're going to grow most vigorously and branch most and so become the heaviest part of the root system where there's more moisture. If your foundation has cracks in it or moisture accumulates there, you're going to get tree roots there, um, even if you plant further away from the foundation. If the foundation is sound and it's dry, you're not going to get tree roots bothering it. And uh, the best place, I think, to look into that kind of stuff is in... Uh, Denmark, the Forestry Service in Denmark did um, a survey of historic buildings. And you know, in Denmark, we're talking historic castles. We're talking about 700 year old buildings. And what they found was that if the, if the mortar was intact, if the foundation was intact, if the wall was intact, then vines and trees were not bothering the foundation. So make your foundation sound and then plant your tree, but don't expect any tree to not find a wet foundation. Its roots will be there. Roots are amazing, they really are. You can see our presentation that we did for the Kalamazoo Soil Conservation District. Um, as soon as we get that up on, some of you may have been there for that presentation about roots and how to plant trees and how they grow. Um, we totally forgot to post it. Um, so I'm going to get that posted soon, so it'll be up on YouTube. You can watch our website and we'll tell you when it comes up. Awesome. Deer eat red twig dogwood. Ideas for deer resistant shrubs. Have I seen them eat red twig? I have not seen them eating red twig dogwood. I have not. We uh, not graced them either. Yeah. So maybe they don't, but that that's that's, that's only a maybe. That's a big maybe. Deer, what, what they don't eat, there are very few things that in our time watching them, we have, they have not eaten. They don't, have not eaten butter, uh, bottle brush buckeye. They have not eaten lindera. They might taste it. You can see a nibble here and there, but they don't come in and browse on it all the time. Um, what else do they not eat? Um, they, they generally don't eat pine and spruce they eat those when they're starving. They will eat them, but they don't like to eat those. What else do they not eat? No nutrient value. <laughs> yeah. Um, they haven't eaten calicanthus, sweet shrub. And that might how be- How about the Eurofos 
Right, the Ural, the, we're looking for natives though, Steve, and Ural Falls oh, Ridge sorry. and Ural Mountains, so it's not uh, here. Um, what other natives? Now the problem with- They haven't one, eaten the Fathergilla at, at, uh, at Zeus. Zeus. Yeah, they eat everything else, but they haven't eaten Fathergilla, so they might not eat Fathergilla. The problem though with what they don't eat is that like Fatherbrush Buckeye, the bucks will still come in and beat it up with their antlers. Um, they'll sprout back up and come back up again. Well, they haven't eaten the nine bark. Uh, they don't. They haven't been eating nine oh. bark any place that I've been watching. So nine bark might be a choice. But you're still going to have the the uh, the bucks that come in <laughs> and beat these things up, and they they can beat them up royally. So a suffering shrub is a good idea. Something that can keep coming back up even though it's gotten broken off on the top. Stupid deer. <laughs> They're so beautiful, and it makes me feel so sad when I see one hit by the side of the road, and yet they're out there eating our gardens all the time. Quite it's perfect. always a maybe with deer. Yes, Mary, it's always a maybe with deer. Okay. Well, I think if we are, uh, we are ready to uh, rest up for another good day, sounds like we might have one more day, if it doesn't rain on us, to get out there and, and uh, plant, and do plant, we're planting and moving things around until the ground is, is frozen. Uh, so maybe you can do that too. Thank you very much to um, all of you for being here. Um, and thank you very, very much to Relief Michigan for putting this together. And we'll hope to partner and do some more things together afterwards. Thanks a lot, Melinda, for putting it together.